Yo guys, so you might have noticed that the background behind me is a bit different. Well, that's because I moved, and I moved into a house that also contains the person that is... Behind him! Uh-huh. What's up, guys? Caleb Townsend reporting for duty. Yeah, so I moved in with Caleb, and I thought that uh, it would be cool to have him on, on this video. <laughs> yeah, it would be very cat, cool. His cat hates me. Um, she hates everyone. Yeah, so I'll have uh, both of us talk, um, and I'd like Caleb to talk a bit uh, after me. I just really wanted to bring up uh, the topic of stock, because stock is pretty similar to money in that we all kind of just assume that it has value, um, but like you can exchange stock for, for money, and like different stocks have different value. Um, and something that's pretty interesting that I, um, that I knew about was there are some companies that are uh, using like AI now to trade stock with each other, and those companies um, because the AI is so efficient and it's way more efficient than a person can be, um, a lot of those companies are now moving in closer to networking like hubs so that they can exchange stocks with each other much quicker. And if you don't have your company as close to that hub as other companies, then you're going to lose out on a lot of money um, because there's going to be someone else who can get at that that exchange much faster and their AI is going to notice um, what stocks they can trade much faster and be able to just by a hair trade a little bit faster and that goes along with the flexibility that Cook brought up in his video. Hello. Um, and yeah, so I really just wanted to bring up that point. I thought that that was pretty interesting. Caleb, you have some thoughts? Speaking of flexibility, <laughs> here's a weird flex. My friend, Tim, one time told you guys, which would you rather have, money, power, or prestige? He also one time told me that Two and a Half Men's not that bad of a show, but we'll move past that. Money and power are very intrinsically tied together. That seems pretty obvious. However, one truly sees the value of money when one is poor. We've all heard the quote, money can't buy happiness, and while... In some respects, in an old cartoon about a rich man who's still miserable, or a current presidency, we can see that that's true. I'm kidding. We're not getting political. We can see that's true to an extent. However, a lack of money can cause misery. We're at a point now where, realistically, within our system, we've created an artificial scarcity. We don't really need to work for our food anymore. We can pop our food into a microwave. We don't need to work for our food anymore, and we certainly wouldn't have any trouble actually distributing food to everyone, what with GMOs and all that. We are in the system now where you can die for not having enough money, and furthermore, your quality of life significantly goes down. One example I always throw out is consider the type of people who do not have a lot of money in their eating habits. People always wonder why poor people eat poorly often that can that's a stereotype that sometimes is true and a lot of times it is true because you they can't afford to buy quality food that often they can't buy fresh food per, certainly because it spoils very quickly if your food spoils very quickly you either a spend too much money on food that ends up being wasted or b you just like have irregular eating schedules and you're just like chowing down celery all day and that doesn't really seem that good either. So they buy food that stays for a very long time. Now what kind of food would that be? Ramen noodles? Spam? And other non-perishables that aren't really susceptible to a healthy lifestyle. While there are stuff that is non-perishable that is organic, they tend to jack up the prices on those because we've placed value on health in a way that really messes a lot of people up. Now we apply that monetary concept to a broader sense. Money, in a lot of ways, is another form of oppression. It's another form of slavery. That might sound a little extreme, and I might regret saying that. Let's hope Tumblr doesn't get to watch this. But a lot of money is a lot more access, and having no money really impedes access to a ridiculous amount of things. Imagine the people who couldn't possibly pay for a license because 
they have a very tight job that isn't paying them enough and they have two kids. And think of all the things that not having a license can stop you from doing. Certain states, it can stop you from voting. So then what do we do with that knowledge, right? I'm not proposing that we throw money away as a system entirely. Obviously the barter system isn't, is pretty limited, I think, and very subjective. One has to question the longevity, the projected longevity of the Federal Reserve in and of itself. Robert, you talked about trust earlier. There's a lot of reasons to not trust the Federal Reserve in a lot of concepts. Now certainly something like FedCoin or Bitcoin, who's to say that's trustworthy either? But with the 2008 um, housing crisis and the Great Depression and stock market drops with all the business guys plummeting out of windows and stuff, we have to acknowledge that at some point we might be looking into an alternative for money and perhaps something that we can figure out more accessibility to or accountability to. I'm not really sure. So for the next topic, uh, I know this might seem like it's a little bit political. I think that we can navigate it though as it's not as not being political though. Um, so with the election that just happened, I am curious about um, where all of you get your news from. Because I don't actually think that we talked very much about like where we specifically get our news from. Personally, I get uh, like a base news from Phil DeFranco on YouTube, um, and I get like a few other news items. Like sometimes I read like NPR or listen to NPR. I sometimes listen to Ben Shapiro's podcast, uh, and I try to be not only nonpartisan but kind of con kind of consume both parties' um, ideas and kind of sift through what, what those ideas are on both sides. That's a much better method than the perspective I always take slash the practices that I take. I usually get a lot of my news from social media. I don't really view news as partisan in any context. I think that it's near darn impossible for a journalist to separate their own perspective from news because even if you're writing in a third person and just trying to report the facts the facts that you omit the way that you swing statistics can even be in favor or in detriment to a specific person or idea personally now I think that within money too because this affects money as well the monetization of news is now getting to a point where clickbait is pretty much the only form of news that is being put out there often because if you don't get clicks you don't get ad revenue if you don't get ad revenue your boss is a huge pain in the butt to you that being said now we are in the hot take era where to get any kind of presence on social media it's all about opinions 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 so i get a lot of my news from very specific sources uh I hear instantaneous response from a lot of different groups on the same subjects all the time. Almost a more cartoonish and extreme way of what Josh does. I follow super hardcore leftist groups um, like Chapo Trap House and Slavov Zizek's Dank Meme Stash. I have not even heard of those. Yeah, they're, 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 they're leftists as all get out. Um, I browse around uh, the Donald, which is the Donald Trump subreddit that isn't really a Donald, it's, it's an alt-right subreddit essentially, but I kind of lurk there to hear viewpoints on that. I go to Twitter, I try to get people's uh, takes on any news that could affect policy from marginalized groups. Uh, I try to look into world news. I found that sources like Reuters and uh, BB&C a lot of news that's done about American events from another country actually become somewhat partisan because they aren't invested in the same political opinions as we are. So if Donald Trump does something, like Reuters isn't going to run some like strong hit piece on them because like, Reuters doesn't care what Donald Trump did unless it's just like something that's like interesting policy. Um, I think having a varied news diet is good. 
because at the end of the day, sponsor content is ubiquitous among all content. Um, any article about a new act about an actor, it could be an actor that is just like beating a woman, and at the end of it or the beginning of it, they'll like probably reference like the movie that's coming up that actor's in soon because it's sponsored content. So, at a certain point, you just kind of have to be selective and understand that no new source is going to be perfect. You're never going to get that one source that always is hard-hitting with something that's like, wow, I feel this, they gave me all the facts. You just have to do your best and use your best discerning skills and use every tool at your compass, every fact-checking, even though... You know, now they say Snopes is, like, biased, too. So if the fact-checkers are biased, then, like, who can we trust? Who watches the Watchmen? Mm -hmm. But we're all trying to do our best, I think. And I'm really curious if you guys do stuff, especially not online, if you guys read newspapers or if you guys watch the, uh, any televised news, which is kind of barely news at this point. I think a lot of televised news is just something happens. Now here's, like two people with opposite opinions arguing about it because that's news now yeah yeah and one other reason that i wanted to bring up this topic is every now and then i hear about uh some some situation that's going on in some other country like the stuff that's been happening in yemen um i'll hear about that and like not know how i had hadn't heard about anything that had led up to that um and i kind of wonder whether you guys feel the same way yeah, and how, how other people remedy that. Yeah. You know what's really sad? You know how I found out about Yemen? How? I found out from a tweet by Jim Carrey. That was the first way that I found out that anything was even happening in Yemen. And that's pretty horrible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever news source you choose, really, this right here should be your primary news source. Absolutely. Subscribe to Four Avocado right now. Caleb and Josh... Signing out. Peace. Do you have a catchphrase? Should we do a... Four... No, no, no we don't. No. For Vicado? I hardly know her. <laughs>